Praise the Lord. Psalm 123. Psalm 123. It's year 2023. And at the turn of the century, last century, turn of the 20th century, we're in the 21st century now. The turn of the 20th century, um, Psalm 1901, Psalm 1, 1902. And all through the years and the wars and everything were seen through the Psalms. To the year 2000, Psalm 100. And all the way through to last year, Psalm 122. And uh, Psalm 123. And I did mention something about it, but let's read it again. I talked about it a bit last week. week before it might have been. And there's some amazing things in there. Psalm 123. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, and the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease with the contempt of the proud. I'd like to read this from the Passion. O God enthroned in heaven, I lift my eyes toward you in worship. The way I love you is like the way a servant wants to please his master. The way a maid waits for the orders of her mistress. We look to you, our God, with passionate longing to please you and discover more of your mercy and grace. For we've had more than our fill of this scoffing and scorn, this mistreatment by the wealthy elite. Have you had enough? You want a bit more? We've had enough, haven't we? <laughs> I don't know. We're fed up with it. Well, the end of 2022, that was all we want to take. Lord, so in 2023, Lord, show us your mercy. Lord, show us your grace. We're not able to deal with it much as we try and try to work it out. The thieves and robbers, we've got to rise above that. We've got to take back that stolen grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the secrets that were for the church that they stole, stolen water sweet. Satan's a thief and a robber. Steals the good things. He doesn't steal anything bad from us. He doesn't want anything bad. He wants all the good things to use against us. For himself. For his own kingdom he's trying to build. He wants the money. He wants the real estate. He wants the souls. He wants all the wealth. He wants everything. Wanting, wanting, wanting. Gathering, gathering. Only through thievery. Robbery. And it's through deceit he steals. Or through sloth. We're too lazy to do anything about it. Oh, yeah, I know he's doing it, but oh, well, oh, well, Jesus had to come back, fix it all up. We're just waiting for Jesus to come back, fix it up. Slothfulness or laziness or whatever. We have to awaken with the awakening, which we've been sharing about. Awaken to righteousness. We're going to have to rise above all that. Take back what Satan's stolen by the grace of God. God's going to have to help us to do it. So the generation is going to learn how to do it. But the contempt, the contempt, we've had more than our fill of this scoffing and scorn. And they were grumpy about it. And we see that in the definition of contempt. Contempt is a pattern of attitudes and behavior, often towards an individual or a group, but sometimes towards an ideology, which has the characteristics of disgust and anger. You know, it's right to be disgusted and angry at the persons of the wicked, Satan and his crowd, and those that work wickedness. It's, it's um, okay to have that righteous um, indignation, that disgust. You know, if we smile at sin, there's no fear of God there. We love the sinner, hate the sin. We have to really grow up to learn how to do that. It's not that simple. Especially if you look at uh, the person as the only problem there is. You know, there's mindsets, there's attitudes, there's demons, devils, fallen angels. There's ideologies. We've, I've had enough of the ideology that we have to be slaves to another system. Paul called himself a bond slave to Christ, but Satan has wanted us as his slaves in humanity 
through traditions, through thinking, through corrupt governments and all other sorts of systems in the seven mountains of society, to be over us and we're underneath it so that we're slaves to the system or systems. You had enough of that? Yeah. I've had enough of that. Oh, well, that's just the way it is. Well, if it's the way you want it. It doesn't have to be that way. It's not supposed to be that way. Now, the children of Israel, when they started crying out in the wilderness, they started crying out because they realized, hang on a minute, hang on, hang on. They'd probably put enough for a long time, but they had an awakening when it started to get really tough. And the tougher it got, they really started crying out to God. Then they started turning on the servant of God. Moses, you're making this worse. But contempt started to rise up. We've had enough of this. This is not right. God, they started crying out to God. God heard them and sent them a deliverer. And uh, the very thing God sent them, uh, they started turning on him. And that's what I feel God wants to get through to us. That, okay, we've been crying out to God for deliverance. He starts sending us deliverers in the forms of teachers, prophets, and we reject them. We embrace the ones that we love to hear with tickling ears. Didn't the scripture say that? They'll gather themselves teachers with tickling ears. They tell me what I want to hear, tell me what I like to hear, and then I'm happy. I'm happy in my slavery. Because it's nice. What the programming is, is you will be happy with nothing. Just be happy with nothing. No, thank you. Give me your everything, and I'll give you a little bit so you've got nothing, but I'll just give you enough. Stuff yours, up yours. No, I'm taking it back. We've got to have contempt against this wickedness, or nothing will change. But it's not going to come through mental ascension, or mentally trying to come against it. I'm sure that will do something, but it's not enough. We must come up. We must come up. After Jesus finished speaking to um, the seven churches in Revelations 2 and 3, so, you know, there's many ways to look at that. The church through the ages, the churches of that time, the churches through the times when Jesus said you'll be ransacked and Jerusalem will be taken through that time. All the way to the end, the different eight parts of the church age. At the end, time of the end, seals come off. There's all different ways to look at it and there's truth in them all. But looking at it, looking right through it, afterwards... Revelation 4, verse 1, come up here. John the Isle of Patmos, getting these visions, seeing these things. Write these words, write these words, write these words. And after these things, you saw a door open in heaven. Come up here. Up where? Up. Say up. 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 You have to come up and rise up above the circumstance, the attitudes, the mindsets of this age. We have to start ruling and reigning with Christ. The world can't win this. Must as they try to. Not even President Trump. I think God wanted to prove that. Even though he's chosen, he'll be back. Probably at work now. All these theories, whatever. It's not so important. The most important thing is the church awakens. Church rises up. God has his men in authority. The reason why David and the different ones have risen up before is because God sent them because of their cries. They cried out to God to help. And God sent deliverance. They cried out to God for help. Not God sent a deliverer. They wouldn't even know what sort of deliverer they needed. God to help. They got in desperate situations, desperate circumstances, and cried out to God. So we see in Psalm 123, 1, 2, 3, that they were filled with contempt. We see in Psalm 124, we were like those who dream. Maybe something's going to happen in the year 1, 2, 3, 2023, it's going to be so great that we'll look back and think it's just like a dream. It's just, it's different. <laughs> that old life where we were under the hand of Pharaoh was just like a dream. We're free now. I think um, it's a good year to get excited. But if we're mis, you know, misunderstanding what the scriptures are saying and what the prophets are saying, that's fine. We'll wait another year. As Brother Hagen said, if you're willing to wait forever, it won't take too long. <laughs> Amen. Let's stop putting times on everything, timetables on everything. Trying to tell... Everyone, what the prophets are saying, what they mean. I mean, they'll be really honest. I'm waiting for honest prophets. They're starting to come. But I'm waiting for honest prophets to say, I've received this word, this vision. And then they get asked by someone else to interpret it. They should say, I don't know what it means. 
Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But if they're always interpreting their own prophecies, it's not really um, God's way. We all need it. One person sees a little bit, someone sees something else. Someone sees something else. Someone sees something else. Someone else has interpretation. One has a prophecy. One has a tongue. We have to get back to the scriptural way. God's way. And if we do it God's way, it always deals with man's pride. God doesn't want big chocks and know-it-alls. He wants humility. God wants to do what he wants to do. And he doesn't want us in the road. God is watching all this. God will respond. Psalm 45, verse 7. You know, the eyes of the Lord. We might look up some eyes of the Lord scriptures here. I think it's past the Lord. Psalm 45, verse 7, the Amplifier Classic, says, You love righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God, and hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Jesus had such anointing, such power, because he, he loved what was right, and he hated what was evil. Jesus had a hatred for what was evil. Proverbs 8, verse 7, says, For my mouth speaks truth, and my lips hate wickedness. The wisdom of God, the mind of God, Jesus Christ, hates wickedness. We've got a generation that tolerates wickedness and in some ways embraces it. And even the churches embrace many of the wicked ways and thought patterns of the world. And we have to, um, you know, we have to change. If no one likes us or doesn't understand us, Maybe not what we're after, but it's okay. It's better to be okay with the one, or with the few, than okay with the masses. It's been programmed into us that everyone has to like you, everyone has to love you, you have to be accepted by everyone. There's such a hunger and desire in this generation to be accepted by everyone. But the Bible says to be accepted by man is to be rejected by God. To be accepted with God and to be a friend of God, you've got to become an enemy of man. Generally, not everyone. But not everyone's going to agree. So we can't go about trying all the time to have everybody agree with everything we say. Well, let me explain this is what I mean. I don't mean that. Now, hang on a minute. Hang on, hang on, hang on. No. No, we don't have to tickle the ears. Mm-hmm. Say what God's saying. Reveal what he's said, what he's shown. And that should be enough. Um... Let's look at the eyes of the Lord on the righteous. God has heard our cry and he's going to respond. Who believes God's going to respond? He just can't pray week after week, month after month, year after year. And then these days now are starting to get desperate. Because hang on a minute, I don't even know whether the prophets are even... Um, they, God's got to work on the prophets. Dear God, what else have we got? We need you. God, please help. Show us your mercy. Show us your grace. Psalm 1, 2, 3. Show us your mercy, show us your grace. Psalm 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The eyes of the Lord, God's watching. He has seen everything that's happened since day one. He's seen all that the enemy's done through the millennia. And every person, family, nation, generation, that they'll all be repaid, if not by them, by their descendants. There is payment coming. God hears and his eyes are open to their cry. Proverbs 5 verse 21. Proverbs 5 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his paths. God sees the ways, thoughts and intents. He sees right down inside, doesn't he? Not just what we do. And he ponders all his paths. He sees where they're going, what they're doing, what they're doing, what they're doing. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God will respond. God sees. God knows. Amos 9 verse 8 Behold, the eyes of the Lord are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy. He's going to 
not kill everyone. Sinful kingdom? Wow. Maybe there's going to be a lot of people perishing in the future. Probably. Just like Revelation says. Zechariah 4 verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord. The Lord is balancing, weighing up everything. He holds the plumb line. 1 Peter 3 verse 12. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. God's listening. Amen. Hallelujah. He's hearing us. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God is listening to those that cry to God. God, show us your grace. Show us your mercy. Show us what to do. God, you are our rescuer. God, give me strength to go ahead and do what I need to do, what you're telling me to do. Not telling God what God needs to do, when he needs to do it, and how he has to do it. Might sound impressive, but the two are opposite ends. The pole are different. God calls the shots. Amen? Times and seasons are in God's hands. The Antichrist is going to try to change times and seasons. That's wickedness. And those that align with him trying to control the times and the seasons, knowing or, knowingly or unknowingly, I'm not talking about just open rebellion. A lot of this is just ignorance we need to mature up with. We should not try to be convincing God when and how he has to do stuff. He's going to do it. He's going to do it good. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Just heart is fixed, steadfast and loyal. Just, you can be going through all sorts of trouble on this earth and it can really, really cause a lot of pain and hardship. And God knows that. But his eyes look and see that. If you just keep your heart fixed on God, he sees that. He's going to come and rescue. He's going to come and help. He's going to strengthen you to be able to uh, endure. He'll give you his grace. 2 Chronicles 29 verse 6. For our fathers have trespassed and done evil in the eyes of the Lord, our God. They have forsaken him and turned their faces away. So has there been a lot of things happening through the church age, especially through the time of the end, the lukewarm part of the church age? Talking about, it can be looked at in that way as well. The later sins, the lukewarm. Has, have our fathers, have many of our teachers trespassed and done evil in the Lord's eyes? It's not about our eyes. We may think, oh, they're wonderful. Probably do. It makes us feel good, sound good. Oh, yes. Glory. Glory. But in the eyes of the Lord, it may be that way. It may be not. We must have the Lord's vision and see what he sees and understand from his perspective. Our fathers trespass and done evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and turned their faces away. They may be saying all the right things. Christian thinks, singing all the right Christian songs, doing the hallelujah and the prayer. But if their heart is turned away and they are lovers of their own selves, their own opinions, even their prophecies have become their own, they're not coming from the heart and voice of God and start to embrace them as truth, start, they'll start to go away. They'll turn their face away from the Lord. Lord, show us your grace, show us your mercy, Psalm 1, 2, 3. Genesis 6, verse 8. When the earth went through its most difficult hour, and it's going to happen again, even now, in the days of Noah, Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so will it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. He promised he wouldn't flood it with water again. So it's not going to be flooded with water again. But there will be a flood of fire. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, 8. Who's going to find grace in the eyes of the Lord in the time of the end? Those like Noah. Have a heart after God. Fix steadfast. We'll do what he asks. Do what he says. May not be the accepted people of the time. I'm not saying there's just going to be one like Noah. You know, do you realise at the time of Noah there's only one? There was not him and the missus, three sons and their wives. They all went into the ark. God rescued them because he's gracious and merciful. You've got to have someone to populate the earth with as well. But only Noah. There was only one. 
That's it. Noah, last one left. Talk about risky business. What if Noah stuffed up? Oh, God put it in Noah, didn't he? Amen. Born for such a time. Some have been born for this. Well, everyone's born for this time. Some will be qualified to, to go on because of their um, dedication to God. That's why Jesus said comments like, many called, few chosen. So maybe at the end there'll only be few chosen. Who are they? Well, we're going to have to stoop low for them to become our teachers. Because they may teach us in a way that we don't understand. We've never been this way before. We are men at all those wonderful sermons. Never been this way before. Oh yeah. Some of the revivalists of past revivals have said this. The coming revivals are always persecuted the most, some, sometimes by other people too, but the most by those that have gone through the last one. Why? That's not how it's done. That's not how it's done. That's not what we've been told. That's not what I've seen. This must be the devil. And they mess it because they, you know, through ignorance or can be through pride too. A lot of times it probably is pride. They persecute the righteous. Didn't Jesus say all the prophets died at the hands of the wicked religious leaders? Some of them are ignorant, in ignorance. They just think it's right. Like Paul, he said, I did it in ignorance. Many of them, it's not ignorance at all. They crucified Jesus, not in ignorance. They crucified him in envy. They envied him. He shone a light in their sins and they didn't want to deal with it. Not all, but most turned against Jesus. He just spoke the truth in love. He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't harm anyone. The Bible says he's just so gentle, he wouldn't even bend a flax. He's just, he's the sort of person that would walk around a person out there dodgy. Not want to hurt anybody or anything. But he spoke truth in love and in power that gripped the hearts of the hypocrites. I've been sharing about that. In here last week, or when he, um, it's a good message to hear. It would have gone into today and maybe where we're headed. But um, we have to come out of hypocrisy. We have to come out of the um, double mindedness and pretending. No more pretending. You have to be truthful and love the truth. Lovers of the truth. And there's layers of truth for, for each generation, too, I feel. And that's where some of the, that's where some of the um, pride may come from. The truth, the word, then. The layer of that word. See, God's, God's word is like silver purified seven times. Seven is perfect number. It's completeness. Some people say, well, the word of God has seven meanings. It could be infinite. Seven doesn't always just mean time seven. It can be uh, perfection. There's, there's, for eternity, we'll go on learning and plummeting the depths of the word of God. But at least seven times. Imagine seven times. So the generation that understands the number six meaning may persecute the generation that God is going to do something new and reveal something else. No, hang on, that's not what it means. That's not what it means. Yeah. You see what I mean? It's subtle. And uh, there can be innocence here, but we have to stoop low and be teachable all over again. As if we've never learned anything. Hallelujah. And uh, that's why Jesus said, we have to humble ourselves as little children. To enter the kingdom. You know, the face of the kids are always before the face of God the Father, the children, always there because of their innocence. They haven't sinned knowingly and turned away from light, eternal light, and they're before the angels are before the heart of the face of the Father, the angels are there, giving reports. And if anyone mistreats a child, Jesus said it's better they weren't even born. So as we purify ourselves through the living water, through the grace of God. God's words purify us. As we start to change and get misunderstood, we have to learn how not to be offended and let people uh, judge us. And that's, that's going to be just too hard for some folks because I, I just have to be loved and accepted. If I'm not loved and accepted, I don't. We have to want the love of God, the one, more than the love from people. We want love from people. We want acceptance. It's in us all. But understand, there's a higher love. And if you embrace the higher love and truth and get misunderstood by someone, you're going to have to leave that with God. It may hurt at the time, but as you grow up and develop in your spirit, it will hurt less and less as time goes on if you will, if you will um, love God. Hallelujah. I can't remember who it was. Someone went to heaven and I was taken to heaven and... Uh, 
I think it was before the time because they came back and said what they saw. And they, there was this, this person, it was their mum, remember now? It was their mum, I think. A couple saw something, and one was their mum. And they were worshipping, they saw them, God showed them, so they knew that they were okay. Worshipping, and God showed them that the person that was worshipping God knew they were there, but they didn't turn around. Why? They were in worship at that time. On earth, oh, hang on, God. We'll, we'll make every excuse not to worship. But that is pure love. And in heaven, it was understood that he's number one. Hmm. Hallelujah. I might just better finish up there. One more little story. I think I've shared it before. Probably more than once. Stories get old. But my wife once was a bit grumpy of all the time I was spending with God. Leah was. She, she testified, so it's okay. I'm in the clear. And uh, this went on and on. I thought, dear God, what am I going to do? All I'm doing is praying and reading the Bible. I'll be up. I was a little bit fanatic. I was up late at night. The light was on. <laughs> when are you coming to bed? Hang on, hang on. This bother is amazing. Turn that light off out there. And uh, this went on. I thought, dear God, what am I going to do? And uh, God gave me the wisdom. I said, hey, sweetheart, listen. If I'm going to be the husband that, I've, that God wants me to be that you really need, I have to learn to be, I have to learn to love God. If I'm going to, I don't know how to love him unless I love God. I'm learning. And she was fine after that. She realised that, hey man, this is for my benefit. <laughs> hey man, you know, it needs to change anyway. In some areas, which is true. Still need to. So out of our focus and love for God, we're transformed as we behold his glory. So just get into God, number one. You're not forsaken people. You're not, not loving people. Just people have to realise that, look, there is someone else that's important in your life. They may get offended. Probably will. It's okay. What if they don't understand? Maybe they don't. Maybe they never will. But they usually will come around. They just need to know that you, you, you love God. He's number one. He's, he's their number one too. They just don't know it. They just don't realise it. They should make him number one because he's their creator. He gives them the next breath. He, he made the little heart beat in the womb. You know the first, thing to, first two things to form in the tiny little fetus, just tiny, tiny, barely seen, is the heart and the ear. Hearing ear and beating heart. Isn't that amazing? Hallelujah. God is wonderful. He is to be feared and reverenced. As we cry to God for mercy... So do the psalm one, two, three. God, show us your mercy, show us your grace. And do it because we have had enough. See, it's not just for ourselves. God, I just want to come out from the hand of all this trouble. No, no, it's for humanity. Had enough for hearing about people dying, dropping on the sports field. People broke, people starving, little swelled up tummy kids everywhere. People locked away in dungeons, people sick and diseased. Poisoned. You've got to have enough of it and let that righteous indignation rise up and start crying out to God. Yes, we do all we can, yes. But God ultimately is the deliverer. He's the one that sends the deliverers in Jesus' name. Amen.